We're going to read those as uh, sort of summary or identifying text of this gospel, which we've given the uh, overarching title, Jesus the King. Uh, we'll get into that a little more obvious in a moment. So stand with me if you would, and I want you to follow along. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you so that you can see the Word of God. We will read this and pray, and then watch the two videos. Matthew 16, verses 16 to 19. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In the videos we're going to watch, the, the narrator makes the point that one of the identifying uh, marks of Messiah was that he would be Emmanuel, or the Hebrew Immanuel, meaning with us God. And so it's fascinating that the Gospel of Matthew closes where he pledges that I am with you always, uh, Emmanuel, to stay with his people. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God, and we're going to take that in tonight. I would simply remind you before we sit down, before we pray and sit down, John 5, 39 and 40 is the theme text that prompted this study back now, uh, almost a year ago, where Jesus said to the leaders, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they, the Scriptures, that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. He was speaking, of course, of, of their Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now, where the Puritans said that the New Testament the new, is in the old concealed. The Old Testament is by the new revealed. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you tonight and acknowledge you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to you in Jesus' name. Grateful we can gather together on this Lord's Day evening to close out the Lord's Day together, contemplating how we see Jesus. He chided the religious leaders because they had memorized the Tanakh and yet missed him. And Lord, we want to be people not only who, who see Jesus in every Old Testament book as we have undertaken uh, that study, but we want to really see him for who he is. We want you to expand our understanding of him, to deepen our love for him, to provoke in us the inescapable consequence that we must speak of him and cannot help but testify of what we've seen and heard about him. So help us tonight by your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes that we may see the gospel of Matthew, no matter how familiar we may be with it, see the gospel of Matthew in ways that we've not seen it before as we turn this diamond of the gospel and see the many facets that reflect your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. We're going to watch two videos, so sit tight about... 14, 15 minutes worth of video, but I think it's going to be well worth your while when we get back into our study. The Gospel according to Matthew 
It's one of the earliest official accounts about Jesus of Nazareth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. The book itself is anonymous, but the earliest reliable tradition links it to Matthew the tax collector, who was one of the 12 apostles that Jesus appointed, and he actually appears within the book itself. For about 30 to 40 years, the apostles orally taught and passed on their eyewitness accounts about Jesus, along with his teachings that they had all memorized. And Matthew has then collected and arranged all these into this amazing tapestry and designed the book to highlight certain themes about Jesus. In this video, we're just going to cover the first half of the book. Specifically, Matthew wants to show how Jesus is the continuation and fulfillment of the whole biblical story about God and Israel. That Jesus is the Messiah from the line of David, that he is a new authoritative teacher like Moses, and not only that, Jesus is God with us, or in Hebrew, Emmanuel. And Matthew's designed this book with an introduction and then a conclusion, and these act like a frame around five clear sections right here in the center, each of which concludes with a long block of Jesus' teaching. Now this design is very intentional and it's amazing. Just watch how this works. Chapters 1 through 3, they set the stage by attaching Jesus' story right onto the storyline of the Old Testament scriptures. So Matthew opens with a genealogy about Jesus that highlights how he is from the messianic line of the son of David, and he's a son of Abraham. That means he's going to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. After that, we get the famous story about Jesus' birth and how all of the events fulfilled the Old Testament prophetic promises that the nations would come and honor the Messiah, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, but even more than that, Jesus' conception by the Holy Spirit, his name Emmanuel, all these work together to show that Jesus is no mere human. He is God with us. God become human. So you can see two of Matthew's key themes right here in the introduction. He's from the line of David. He's Emmanuel. But Matthew also wants to show how Jesus is a new Moses. So like Moses, Jesus came up out of Egypt. He passed through the waters of baptism, and he entered into the wilderness for 40 days. And then Jesus goes up onto a mountain to deliver his new teaching. So through all of this, Matthew is claiming that Jesus is the promised greater than Moses figure who's going to deliver Israel from slavery. He's going to give them new divine teaching. He's going to save them from their sins and bring about a new covenant relationship between God and his people. This Moses and Jesus parallel also explains why Matthew has structured the center of the book the way that he did. These five main parts highlight Jesus as a teacher, and he's created a parallel. Jesus as a teacher parallels the five books of Moses. Jesus is the new authoritative covenant teacher who's going to fulfill the storyline of the Torah. Now, in the first section, chapters 4 to 7, Jesus steps onto the scene announcing the arrival of God's kingdom. And this is really key. The kingdom is, in essence, about God's rescue operation for his whole world. And it's taking place through King Jesus. Jesus has come to confront evil, especially spiritual evil, and its whole legacy of demon oppression and disease and death. Jesus has come to restore God's rule and reign over the whole world by creating a new family of people who will follow him, obey his teachings, and live under his rule. So, after Jesus begins healing people and forming a movement, a community, he takes his followers out to a mountain or a hillside, and he delivers his first big block of teaching, traditionally called the Sermon on the Mount. And here Jesus explores what it looks like to follow him and live in God's kingdom. And it's an upside-down kingdom where there are no privileged members. So the poor, the nobodies, the wealthy, the religious, everybody is invited and is called to turn, to repent, and to follow Jesus and join his family. Jesus says that he's not here to set aside the commands of the Torah or the Old Testament. Rather, he's here to fulfill all of that through his life, through his teachings. He's here to transform the hearts of his people so that they can truly love God and love their neighbor, including their enemy. After concluding his great teaching on the kingdom, the next section shows Jesus bringing the kingdom into reality in the day-to-day -day lives of people. So Matthew's arranged here nine stories about Jesus bringing the power of God's kingdom into the lives of hurting, broken people. There are three groups of three stories, and they're all about people who are sick or have broken bodies or they're in danger, and Jesus heals or saves them by these acts of grace and power. 
And then right in between these triads, we find two parallel stories about Jesus' call that people should follow him. Matthew's making a point here. One can only experience the power of Jesus' grace by following him and becoming his disciple. Now, after Matthew has shown the power of the kingdom through Jesus, Jesus then extends his reach by sending out the 12 disciples who are going to go do what he's been doing. And this leads to the second large block of teaching, chapter 10. And here, Jesus teaches his disciples how to announce the kingdom and what to expect once they do. Many among Israel are accepting Jesus and his offer of the kingdom, but Israel's leaders, they aren't. They stand to lose a lot if they repent and become disciples of Jesus. And so Jesus knows they're going to reject him and persecute his followers, which is exactly what happens. In the next section, chapters 11 through 13, Matthew has collected a group of stories about how people are responding to Jesus and his message. And it's a mixed bag. So some stories are positive. People love Jesus and they think he's the Messiah. Others are more neutral, like John the Baptist, or even the members of Jesus' own family. And they make it clear that Jesus is not what they expected. And then you have Israel's leaders. They're entirely negative. You have the Pharisees and the Bible scholars. They all reject Jesus together. They think he's a false teacher. He's leading the people astray. They think he's blasphemous and these exalted claims he's making about himself. But Jesus isn't surprised or thrown by all these diverse responses. In fact, he focuses on it in the third block of teaching, chapter 13. Here, Matthew's collected together a bunch of Jesus' parables about the kingdom, like about a farmer throwing seed on four types of soil, or about a mustard seed, or a pearl, or buried treasure. These parables are like a commentary on the stories that you've just read in chapters 11 and 12. Some people are accepting Jesus with enthusiasm. Others are rejecting him. But God's kingdom is of ultimate value, and it will not stop spreading despite all of these obstacles. So that's the first half of the gospel according to Matthew. Now here's a few more things to look for as you read through these chapters. Matthew's presenting Jesus, remember, as the continuation and fulfillment of the Old Testament storyline. So look for how he weaves in quotations from the Old Testament scriptures. And what you'll find is that they're placed at strategic points in the story, explaining more about Jesus and his identity. So stop. Take time to go look up these references and read them in their Old Testament context. And most often you'll discover really cool, interesting connections. Lastly, Pay attention to the types of people who accept Jesus and follow him. And you'll see that it's most often people who are unimportant, they're nobodies, or they're irreligious. And these are the people who are transformed by their trust or faith in Jesus and follow him. And it's the religious and the prideful who are offended by him. So how is this tension between Jesus and Israel's leaders going to play itself out? That's what the second half of Matthew is all about. The Gospel according to Matthew. In the first video, we saw how Matthew introduced Jesus as the Messiah from the line of David and as a new authoritative teacher like Moses, and also as Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God with us. After Jesus announced and taught about the arrival of God's kingdom and after he brought the kingdom into day-to-day life among the people of Israel, we saw that Jesus was accepted by many but rejected by others, especially Israel's religious leaders, the Pharisees. And so the big question is, how is this conflict between Jesus and Israel's leaders going to play itself out? The next large section, chapters 14 through 20, explore all the different expectations people have about the Messiah. So Jesus keeps healing sick people, and twice he even miraculously provides food for these huge crowds in the desert. One is made up of Jewish people, and the other is a non-Jewish crowd. And this sign, it's very similar to what Moses did for Israel in the wilderness. And so all these people are excited about Jesus. They think he's the great prophet and the Messiah, but not the religious leaders. Their view of the Messiah is built on passages like Psalm 2 or Daniel chapter 2 about a victorious Messiah who's going to deliver Israel and defeat the pagan oppressors. And from their point of view, Jesus, he's a false teacher. He's making blasphemous claims about himself. And so there are stories here about them increasing their opposition, hatching a plan to kill him. And so in response, Jesus, he withdraws. And he begins teaching his closest disciples what it means for him to be Israel's Messiah because it is not what anybody expects. 
So Jesus asks his disciples, chapter 16, he says, who do you all say that I am? And Peter comes up with the right answer, it seems. He says, well, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. But then it becomes clear that Peter's thinking about a king who's going to reign victoriously through military power. And Jesus challenges Peter, saying that, yes, I am going to become king, but through a different way. And so Jesus starts to teach on themes from the prophet Isaiah, who said that the messianic king would suffer and die for the sins of his own people. And so Jesus, he was positioning himself as a messianic king who reigns by becoming a servant and who would lay down his life for Israel and the nations. Well, Peter and the disciples, they mostly just don't get it. And so Jesus enters into the fourth block of teaching, followed by a series of teachings after that. And these are all about the upside-down nature of Jesus' messianic kingdom, which turns upside down all of our value systems. So in the community of the servant king, you gain honor by serving others. And instead of getting revenge, you forgive and do good to your enemies. And in Jesus' kingdom, you gain true wealth by giving your wealth away to the poor. To follow the servant Messiah, you must become a servant yourself. In the next section, we watch the two kingdoms clash, Jesus' kingdom and that of Israel's leader. Jesus comes to Jerusalem for Passover riding in on a donkey, and the crowds are hailing him as the Messiah. And Jesus immediately marches into the courtyard of the temple, and he creates this huge disruption that brings the daily sacrifices to a halt. His actions speak louder than words here. As Israel's king, Jesus was asserting his royal authority over the temple, the place where God and Israel met together. And in Jesus' view, the temple was compromised by the hypocrisy of Israel's leaders. And so here he's challenging their authority, and naturally, they're deeply offended. And so they try to trap Jesus and shame him in public debate, and they fail. So they end up just determining to have him killed. In response, Jesus delivers his final block of teaching. He first offers this passionate critique of the Pharisees and their hypocrisy, and then he weeps over Jerusalem and its rejection of God and his kingdom. Then Jesus withdraws with the disciples, and he starts telling them what's going to happen. He's going to be executed by these leaders, but in doing so, they're going to create their own demise, because instead of accepting Jesus' way of the peaceful kingdom, they're going to take the road of revolt against Rome, and so Jerusalem and its temple are going to be destroyed. But, Jesus says, that is not the end of the story. He's going to be vindicated after his death by his resurrection. And one day, he'll return and set up his kingdom over all nations. And so in the meanwhile, the disciples need to stay alert and stay committed to just announcing Jesus and his kingdom and spreading the good news. And so with all of that ringing in the disciples' ears, the story comes to its climax. That night, Jesus takes the disciples aside and he celebrates a Passover meal with them. The Passover retells the story of Israel's rescue from slavery through the death of the Passover lamb. And then Jesus takes the bread and the wine from this meal as new symbols, showing that his coming death would be a sacrifice that would redeem his people from slavery to sin and evil. After the meal, Jesus is arrested. He's put on trial before the Sanhedrin, a council of Jewish leaders. And they reject his claim to be the Messiah. They charge him with blasphemy against God. Then Jesus is brought before the Roman governor, Pilate, and he thinks Jesus is innocent, but he gives in to the pressure from the Jewish leaders, and he sentences Jesus to death by crucifixion. So Jesus is led away by Roman soldiers and crucified. Now, you'll notice right here in this section that just like Matthew did in the opening chapters, he increases the number of references to the Old Testament. He's trying to show that Jesus' death was not a tragedy or a failure, Rather, it was the surprising fulfillment of all of the old prophetic promises. Jesus came as the servant Messiah, spoken of by Isaiah. He was rejected by his own people, but instead of judging them, he is judged on their behalf, bearing the consequences of their sin. So the crucifixion scene, it comes to a close, and Jesus' body is placed in a tomb. But the book ends with a surprising twist, the last chapter. The disciples, they discover on Sunday morning that Jesus' tomb is empty. And then all of a sudden people start seeing Jesus alive from the dead. And the book concludes with the risen Jesus giving a final teaching called the Great Commission. Jesus says that he is now the true king 
of the world. And so he sends his disciples out to all nations with the good news that Jesus is Lord and that anyone can join his kingdom by being baptized and by following his teachings. And echoing all the way back to his name, Emmanuel, God with us from chapter one, Jesus' last words in the book to his disciples are, I will be with you. It's a promise of Jesus' presence until the day he finally returns. And that's the gospel according to Matthew. I would remind you that these videos are available on YouTube if you uh, want to go to YouTube and just type in a search for, for Bible Project and then whatever book of the Bible you're looking for. And they're all available right there. So I continue to be impressed with how these guys draw out uh, in a very powerful way the essence of the books of the Bible. So they're a good help for us here. They're a good visual to help us in our own study. Now concerning the Gospel of Matthew, you'll remember that we've just come out of the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets, prophets predicted and longed for the coming of the Anointed One who would enter history bringing redemption and deliverance. Matthew's Gospel opens up declaring him says that's the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You'll notice when we get to uh, Luke, both Matthew and Luke have a genealogy. Uh, Matthew traces genealogy, Jesus' genealogy back to uh, Abraham because he's, he's driving home a point that this, this long-awaited Messiah, this king of the Jews you've looked for, came in Jesus. Luke, who you remember we is writing to a most excellent Theophilus, a Gentile nobleman, will trace the genealogy of Jesus back uh, to the very beginning, to Adam, to say that Jesus is the Savior of all mankind. He, he saves Jew and non-Jew alike. Being the son of David, the son of Abraham, uh, is the way that Matthew demonstrates that uh, the essential bridge between the Old and New Testaments is found in Jesus. Matthew will quote a lot of Old Testament uh, citations. We'll look at that a little more in terms of numbers of that as we get into this. And through that, he, he documents Jesus' claim to be Messiah. Just real quick, I want to give you kind of an outline of the, uh, of, of the book itself. It'll differ a little bit from what you just saw here, but. When you look for a timeline for, uh, for the, the content, what timeline is covered in this story that Matthew tells us? Well, it's from 4 B.C. to about A.D. 33. Uh, it covers areas like Bethlehem, uh, Galilee, and Judea. And when you lay it out, you find it this way. This is one way to look at it. There is this offer of the king in chapter 1, 1 through 11, 1. This is when Jesus is teaching the, the multitudes or the throngs. He's, there's the presentation of the king up to through chapter 411. There's the proclamation of the king that goes through 729. The power of the king in 81 through uh, 111. And then there comes the, the rejection of the king. This is a turning point in the gospels uh, when the, when the uh, Jewish leaders really assign to him, say that the works that he does, he does by the power of the devil. Uh, it is a classic demonstration of the unpardonable sin, a hardened heart that, that is so hardened and blind that even God's great works are dismissed as the works of the devil. So it's at this point that Jesus begins to primarily teach the 12. Uh, there's this progressive rejection of the king. Uh, then he uses that to withdraw and prepare his own disciples. And then there's the presentation and rejection of the king uh, that moves us through the cross. And then the proof that he is king in chapter 28, 1, the resurrection and the ascension. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew is placed first in the New Testament uh, 
not because it's necessarily chronologically the first book written in the New Testament, but because of the way that Matthew presents things, it becomes a natural bridge between the Testaments. Focuses on Israel's Messianic king. And to understand how, how Matthew uh, lays out his gospel accounts, you key in on this, this term when Jesus had ended or when Jesus had finished. And I want you to see this, to see how this flows through the gospel of Matthew. He does this regarding the Sermon on the Mount. If you'll get to that, thank you very much. Look at Matthew 7, 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished uh, at his teaching. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, of course, was, uh, the, I think it was John Stott in his commentary that said, this is Jesus' kingdom manifesto, what the video called the upside-down kingdom. You have heard it said, but I say to you, uh, the, way, the way to draw near to God is to go low, is to be humbled. And so the Beatitudes, these these. Uh, spiritually blessed is the meaning of the word beatitude or spiritually prosperous are those who are poor in spirit who recognize that they in and of themselves have nothing to contribute to the formula to be made right with God and he goes through these uh, these manifestations these these beatitudes he he teaches he takes the law this because he is the king he is the lawgiver and so he takes the the Ten Commandments some of them and says, you've heard it said, uh, don't murder. But I say to you if, you, if you're angry with your brother in your heart, you've murdered him. Uh, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you that if you lust in your heart after a woman, you've committed adultery. So Jesus points out that the law, though given originally on tablets of stone, he has come. And if you'll remember, when we were studying in, in uh, Jeremiah and in Ezekiel about the new covenant, that the promises of God in the new covenant was that I will write my law on their hearts. Jesus is clearly teaching an internalization of the law. That for God it's a heart matter. The gospels tell us that man looks on the outside appearance, God looks on the heart. Jesus taught it's not what goes into a person that defiles him, it's what comes out of a person. Because it tells us what's in his heart. And so this, he gets in Matthew 7, in the entire seventh chapter of Matthew though it begins with judge not lest you be judged for what judgment you judge you shall be judged the entire remainder of the seventh chapter is about making a right judgment and if you could see if you if your eyes could be uh, transformed so that you could see the, the the nature of the verbs that Jesus uses in Matthew 7 they are almost without exception verbs of command imperative verbs the the sermon intensifies here uh, and comes to the crescendo when he says that he who hears these words of mine and takes them to heart is like this fellow. He who hears them and doesn't take them to heart is like the house built on the sand. And when the difficulties of the rain comes, it crumbles. But, but if you hear these words of mine and, and take them to heart and receive them, you're like a house built on a rock. And so, so this kingdom manifesto of the king is critical to understanding his agenda. The second uh, area is in the instruction of his disciples in chapter 10 verses 5 to 42 and in Matthew 11 1 when Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples. So you see this, this language here tells us he's come to another end of a, of a teaching or, or instructing period. And the next uh, thing is when he, when he goes into the parables of the kingdom. The parable of the sower and the soils you'll remember is in there. The Parable of mustard seed. There's, there's lots of these, these parables laid down. And in chapter 13, verse 53, and when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away. So, so you're, you're getting this flavor. Matthew is telling us he's moving on to another section now that he's finished uh, giving us what Jesus was teaching. The terms of discipleship that come up in Matthew uh, 18, 3 to 35. So that in 19, 1, now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And then the Olivet Discourse is next. That's the, it's some, called by some the little apocalypse. It's about the end times. Matthew 26, 1, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples. So, so that, this is how Matthew 
uh, organizes his account to make a presentation that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He is the one that the prophets predicted. He is the one the people have longed for. And remember, this happens now in a context where 400 years of silence has been broken. As uh, John the Baptist breaks on the scene, as the angels come to Zechariah and to Mary and to Joseph, shattering the silence. And so Matthew's point is to a Jewish audience. Fascinating, I think, that someone who would have been looked upon by his fellow Jews as a traitor, someone who had joined the ranks of Rome, the tax collector, uh, to extort from them uh, monies uh, that God would take him, call him, and make him the messenger uh, to the Jews that this is the Messiah that has come. Uh, then I just want to real quickly remind you of this outline flow so that we don't lose that. Remember that the outline is the presentation of the king, the proclamation of the king, the power of the king, the progressive rejection of the king, the preparation of the king's disciples, the presentation and rejection of the king, and then the proof of the king. That's a good flow for Matthew. When you think about that first section, the presentation of the king, Genesis 12, 3 comes to mind. God's promise to Abram uh, that he would bless him. Jesus comes as the son of Abraham. God said, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that's in the background when Matthew says in chapter 1, verse 1 of his gospel account, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus is the son of David. You'll remember in, in chapter 2, verse 2, we don't, we don't have this on the, on the screens for you, but when the, when the Magi, uh, when these uh, fellows who study the stars came to Herod, said, where is this one who's born king of the Jews? We've, uh, we've seen his star in the east, and we've come uh, to worship him, to pay homage. Uh, the Messiah was, was going to be promised as the son of David. But even though the house of David was in, was in shambles and David's own sons warred against one another, there was the promise that the, the son of David would sit upon the throne of his father. And so uh, Matthew says he's the son of David, the promised king. He's the son of Abraham, the promised blessing of God. And you remember Malachi 3, 1, when we were reading that, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. We know from looking at the documentation, that's a reference to John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek, the Lord whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So Jesus comes. Uh, the sinlessness of this king is proved when he overcomes the satanic temptations that are included in this first section. Satan tempts him to disobey God, to do what, what, he, what it appears to be is best for him, and yet Jesus rebukes him. And I would remind you in those encounters, just as a side note, the devil quoted scripture to Jesus. We don't need to necessarily be impressed because somebody quotes scripture to us. The devil himself quoted scripture to Jesus. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone. Or take the, Jesus said that to the devil. When he said, take and turn these stones to bread, Jesus said, it's written. Man shall not live by bread alone. So this encounter between Jesus and the devil and his, his capacity as the Son of God, coming as the Messiah, to overcome him, sets him on his path. He would have been disqualified had he yielded to any of the temptations Satan set before him. And then you have in the next section this, this proclamation of the king. And here, Matthew does not go chronological for us. If, you, if you're comparing gospel accounts, it's a topical uh, arrangement. He's developing this pattern of Christ's ministry. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, of course, as I said, comes in that. Uh, the discourse uh, is only 15 minutes to read, and yet it is powerful uh, and has influenced 
the world. Then you have the power of the king in chapter 8 through the first part of chapter 11. Uh, there's 10 miracles that are presented in this section. Uh, Jesus has authority over every realm, disease, demons, death, nature. He is, he is demonstrated as being above uh, the natural order. He is greater than that. He commands the natural order. And then, uh, so you have his words, his teaching that is now supported by his works. His claims, in other words, are verified by his credentials. Then the next section is the progressive rejection of the king. Uh, there's a series of reactions to Christ's words and works. The religious leaders become increasingly troubled and they become increasingly opposed. And so Jesus begins to spend more time teaching, uh, preparing his disciples uh, for the coming time when he would be uh, taken by the leaders and crucified. So he's preparing his disciples, the next section of the outline. He communicates the significance of accepting or rejecting his offer of righteousness. Uh, his teaching in this section, by the way, is primarily directed toward those who will accept him for who he is. There's not really a word of encouragement in this area for anyone who rejects him. And so he is, he's preparing his own disciples to realize that as they embrace him, that his messiahship is radically different than what they had been taught. Because here's their, here's their struggle if you can put yourself there. They too have anticipated Messiah. He comes. The religious leaders reject him and therein is the squeeze for the 12 disciples. How can he be? He seems to be in word and work, yet the religious leaders reject him. And there was the vice uh, that the 12 disciples found themselves in. So Jesus teaches them that accepting him, embracing his teaching, embracing him for who he says he is, is a mark of one who belongs to God. And then this in chapter 20, verse 29, up until the end of chapter 27, Jesus turns a lot of his words now toward those who reject him. Some scathing denunciations. It's in this section where he, where he brings down the woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you. The hypocrite word, of course, is the Greek word hypocrates. It means those who put on a mask. He was calling them pretenders. They pretended to be devoted to the word of God. They pretended to be devoted to Yahweh. Uh, and yet they were not. And so the pronouncing of woes is the exact opposite of the beatitudes that he opens his ministry with. The blesseds. So if blessed is spiritually prosperous, woe is you are under judgment. You're under judgment. And of course, this only intensifies the hostility of the religious leaders. And it's in this section also, by the way, that uh, he predicts the terrible fall of Jerusalem uh, and the Jews will be dispersed. And he describes his second coming as the judge and Lord of the earth. And then in chapter 28, the empty tomb, where he proves that everything he said he was, everything he said he would do, everything he said he was going to do uh, is stamped with this thing that they have never seen before. He has resuscitated people in his miracle ministry, but he himself rises from the grave three days later. He is indeed the prophesied Messiah. He is the very Son of God. And someone who can conquer sin and death and hell and the grave uh, cannot be stopped, uh, no matter how intense uh, the opposition is against him. So, his death on the cross is ghastly. Uh, you had to have the eyes of faith to see what was going on there. Yes, it was the Jewish leaders who convinced the Romans to crucify him. Yes, it was the Romans 
who took him and, and administered to him the, the cruelest form of execution known to man at that time. I would remind you, crucifixion was designed by the Phoenicians sometime earlier who wanted to come up with a way to bring excruciating death to someone and, and yet show their vileness by not letting them touch the earth when they were executed, that they were suspended above earth on the cross. Crucifixion brought death more often than not by suffocation. And the victim hanging on the cross, uh, sometimes tied by ropes, uh, Jesus was held there by nails, that they would fight and struggle to hold up. If you can imagine being there, just, just holding on by ropes to sustain that without giving way to that. And when you give way to that, it would cut off your, your airway and struggle to breathe. And, you, and, and of course, you know, if you've studied the, the trauma scale, that the inability to breathe is right near the top of that. If you ever, when you were a child, were playing and you had the breath knocked out of you, it is a frightening thing to experience. And that's what Jesus was experiencing uh, in addition to the bloody, ghastly mess that he was from the beatings he endured as he fought there on the cross. It's horrible. But God had already anticipated that in his prophecies, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Isaiah 53, we esteemed him smitten, stricken by God and afflicted. And there he hung. Not, not the victim of the Jews or the victim of the Romans. He hung there as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He hung there. What they couldn't see, except with the eyes of faith, was that he had taken upon himself the sins of all who would trust in him. And he satisfied God's divine justice by suffering and dying in your place and in my place. It is the most awful event in the history of the world. Every execution taken place before that and since that, no matter how, quote, supposedly innocent the victim was, no mere son of Adam, no mere daughter of Eve is completely innocent. Yet Jesus, the Son of God, was completely innocent. And he suffered the painful, shameful death of the cross. Romans 5, 7 to 8 says this. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's a little bit of a summary, uh, an overview of that. Um, so his sacrifice was perfect and acceptable. And the gospel concludes, the good news concludes with his glorious resurrection and then his ascension as he gives the commission. What about the, uh, uh, the title of it? Uh, it's clearly written by a Jew. You recognize his familiarity with, with uh, Jewish uh, scripture and Jewish tradition. Written to Jews, and in this case written about a Jew, the son uh, of David, the son of Abraham. He's presenting him as the king of the Jews. He chooses carefully selected Old Testament quotations, documenting Christ's claim to be Messiah. The genealogy, the baptism, the messages, the miracles, all point to the same inescapable conclusion if you're reading uh, with impartiality, Christ is king. If I want you to look at just real quickly at Mark 2.14 and Luke 5.27. Because of the title. The title, uh, an early date this gospel was given, the title, Kata Matheon. Uh, according to is the word kata. So, the, so this, this treatise, according to one named Matthew. Look just real, real quickly, Mark 2.14. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And then Luke 5, 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. His name was, was Matthew Levi. Uh, 
the author. As our video said, it's attributed to, uh, to Matthew, uh, the tax collector, and there's not really been a serious challenge. You've been with this long enough now in the study of this that, that, that there will come, even from within evangelical scholarship, challenges sometimes to who the author is in the Old Testament books. No serious challenge given that this is Matthew, the tax collector. It was known and early, early and accepted quickly in early church history. Uh, Eusebius, who was a church historian, uh, quoted a statement by, uh, by Papias, who was around 140 AD, that Matthew wrote the sayings in Aramaic. Though we found no Aramaic copy of, of Matthew's gospel, we told you about the language when we're studying those languages, the intertestamental period of the Hebrew and the Aramaic, a sort of a bridge language, and then the Greek language dominating the culture. Some believe that Matthew wrote an abbreviated version of Jesus' sayings uh, in Aramaic before writing his gospel in Greek for a larger circle of readers. This, this would not be uncommon. This, your, your video said that for 30 or 40 years they gave an oral tradition. It would be reasonable to believe that these disciples wrote down what Jesus taught them, many of the things he had to say, and that's why they would come uh, would have them available. That's why when you, we get into the whole gospel discussion, where we talked about last week, the synoptic challenge of who wrote first, that they're clearly drawing upon sources when you can lay, uh, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke side by side, parallel versions of them in the Greek, and there are whole sections that are word for word duplicated. It's a, it's a good, uh, good likelihood someone's, someone's uh, taking from someone else which authenticates, by the way, the gospel accounts. He was a tax collector, Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, as we read in Mark 2. Uh, he was disliked by Jewish countrymen. And let's, let's see some passages here that, that will help us uh, see when Jesus called him. Matthew 9 9 to 13, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? By the way, tax collectors and sinners... That's, that's sort of like sinners in general, but particularly terrible sinners, tax collectors. But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so, so Matthew, intriguing it is, Matthew records this episode of himself being called and then uh, inviting Jesus to his home and then inviting his, his, his peers to meet with Jesus. And of course, we cited the, the Mark uh, 2.14 verse and Luke 5.27 and 28 tell us about the same calling. And it's also over in Acts 1.13, if you want to turn there, uh, where, where Matthew's name comes up. This is after uh, the, uh, the, the resurrection, the gathering. Acts 1.13, when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. So Matthew was included in this group in the upper room after the resurrection and ascension. We don't know a whole lot about Matthew after this. Uh, there's there's uh, what we call cloudy tradition. Uh, it's generally believed that all of the uh, apostles were martyred in some way, shape, or form. But the point of all this is that, that this gospel account, according to Matthew, was early accepted as authentic and as a story by one of Jesus' 12 disciples. When you try to date this book, 
Uh, it's not easy to date. And if, if, if you do serious study on this, you'll find people suggesting anywhere from 40 AD, which would have been within about uh, seven years after Jesus' ascension, to 140 AD. Uh, and they, they key off of things like in Matthew 27, 8. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood where Judas Iscariot uh, hanged himself and, and, was, and, and fell into the field to this day. Uh, to this day. And that's what they're keying on. Uh, Matthew 28, 15. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Well, what is this day? Uh, seems it's, it's general consensus that using that kind of language means that a substantial amount of time has passed since those events occurred. But it's also observed that since Matthew gives nothing historically about the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred in 70 AD, and Jesus predicted, as Matthew recorded in his gospel account, that whatever date you set needs to be before 70 AD. In chapter 24 and 25 of Matthew, that event is anticipated as Jesus teaches. Some have suggested that when you lay the gospel accounts aside, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that, that Matthew relied upon Mark's account. Remember Mark's account. We've gone through Mark here. Mark's account is Peter's memoirs. So he relied upon the things written by Mark. That you would then place the date of Matthew somewhere between, and this is the best we can do, between 58 and 68 A.D., so just prior, if it's the later date, just prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Perhaps written from, uh, from Palestine or uh, Syrian Antioch. Well, what about the theme and purpose? Well, clearly the, the purpose is to commend Jesus of Nazareth as the long-awaited Messiah, the King of the Jews. Uh, and he carries this out thematically, as we've already suggested to you, in these segments, these, uh, these bodies of teaching uh, mixed in with miracles to, to verify the teaching. What are keys to understanding Matthew? By the way, this is the keys will, will almost always be the same. The, the scriptural keys will almost always be the same as the verses we read. But the key term is Jesus the King, the long-awaited King. Accept him, reject him, he is the King. Turn against him, you'll meet him again one day. He is the risen king. And so that's the, that's the argument that Matthew's making. Of course, the key verses we read at the outset, we want to read them again, though, with a little bit more background fleshed in. Matthew 16, 16 to 19, this is the confession of Peter at Caesarea Philippi. In the, in the bigger context of the passage, whom do men say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist, some... Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? Peter speaks up. You're the Christ. Christos in Greek, remember, is the equivalent. It's the word anointed for the Hebrew word Messias, the anointed one, Messiah. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're, you're the son of God. Your deity. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or son of John, there, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What you just spoken, Peter, is a supernatural revelation. This is not something you would have come to in a conclusion just using your mind. Peter could have seen by Jesus' words and deeds, that he, he certainly was a Messiah type. But the Son of the living God, to, to acknowledge that he is the Son of God, is supernatural revelation from God. And then he tells him, he does a play on words here, remember, you are Peter, little stone. And upon this rock, this slab, this foundation stone, I will build my church. 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's interesting that in Peter, 1 Peter, Jesus, Peter makes the appeal, when you come to him, the living stone, chosen by God and rejected by the builders, you as living stones, and he's using that same playoff there, you as, as compiled of the smaller stones building upon the foundation of Jesus. And then he goes on and talks about the keys of the kingdom. This, this picture comes up in Matthew uh, 18 as well. I give you authority. And if you were going to read this in the flow of the verb tenses, here's how it would go. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound on heaven. It's a, it's a perfect passive. In other words, when you are acting in my authority, and it's the authority, it's the keys of, of discipline here uh, for the church. You see that in, in Matthew uh, 18 as well. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, when we act under apostolic authority, being obedient to the revealed will of Jesus, we are carrying out what heaven has already done. That's the force of the language there. And then, of course, the Great Commission passage. This, there's an interesting picture here, the promise of his authority. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I stand here with absolute sovereign authority. There is no place in heaven or earth that I do not rule. So it's in the light of that, his assertion that he has all authority, that he sends them. As you go, the participle, remember. Going, therefore, there was the assumption on the part of Jesus that his followers would be obedient to him and they would go. They would not go back to, though they seemed to want to do that for a season after the crucifixion. They would go as you go. Make disciples. That's the imperative verb in this commission. The verb of command is to make disciples of all the ethnoi, of all the people groups. And as you make disciples, followers of Jesus, you mark them out. You baptize them in the name of the triune God. And disciples, one of the marks of a disciple is he or she's a learner. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And then the promise from Emmanuel, I will be with you always. Just as Emmanuel came, God with us, just as in John's gospel we're going to see that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, dwelt among us, the promise that I will be with you always. And of course we know as we develop the New Testament that, that the way he is with us always is he sent the Spirit. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The Spirit proceeds from Father and Son to come as the comforter, the teacher of the followers of Christ. Key chapter uh, is the chapter 12. It's the turning point. Uh, and it, uh, the Pharisees acting as the leadership of the nation of Israel formally reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah, saying that his power comes not from God, but from Satan. To this point that Jesus changes the focus of his ministry as he teaches uh, in parables. Remember the disciples ask him, why do you teach in parables? And the, you, it's interesting, when you talk to people, they're not, they're not focused on Matthew, they'll say, well, Jesus taught in parables because parables were sort of everyday stories with a point. Well, that's true, but that's not why Jesus said he taught in parables. He said, I teach in parables because it's been given to you to see the truths of the kingdom, and it's not been given to them. He shifts the, the nature of his teaching. When the, when the religious leaders formally reject him as satanic. He gives increased attention to his disciples and he continues, begins to remind them, I'm going to go as it's been predicted and die. In fact, in the, in the Caesarean Philippi confession, we didn't go down uh, as far, but Jesus began to tell them this and Peter said, no, that's not going to happen. Not on my watch. And Jesus, who had just commended, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, said, get behind me, Satan. No one would stop him from his power.
purpose of being here. Well, okay, how do you see Jesus in Matthew? Well, he is everywhere in Matthew, obviously. But what do we see of him? I think that's what the question we'll be asking in these New Testament, particularly these gospel accounts. Well, he's Israel's promised Messiah and King. Look at, let's just do some real quick reading here. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's right out of uh, Isaiah. Matthew 2, 2. The Magi. Where is he who is born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Matthew 2, 6. Old Testament quotation, and you, O Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel, a shepherd king picture. Then Matthew 3, 17, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased at the baptism. Matthew 4, 15 to 17, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people, another Old Testament quotation, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, and here's his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a very much similar message that John the Baptist comes preaching. Repent, the word repent, we remind you of this is the word metanoia. It is a change of mind, a change of thinking. Someone said it's an agreeing with God. What God calls sin, we agree. We call it sin. And when we see what God calls sin in us, we express a sorrow. We teach our children in the catechism. What is it to repent? It is to be sorry for sin and to hate it and forsake it because it displeases God. So Jesus' message is one of repentance changing your thinking. And it would take a lot of change of thought for people to recognize him as the Messiah <laughs> because of what they'd been taught about him by the Jewish leaders. Matthew 21, 5, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming. This is in the triumphal entry to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Prophecy. Matthew 21, 9, the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, to the son of David. Notice what they're recognizing here. He's the son of David. He is the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord save. That was their cry. Matthew 22, 44 to 45, where he's encountering the religious leaders and really stirring them up. The Lord said to my Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? He's quoting David there. One of the things that completely stumped the religious leaders. And there's only one way that the son of David can call him Lord. And that's if he pre-existed David and then came in the lineage of David. There's only one, one way that that is answered right there. Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven before Pilate. Matthew 27, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you said so. You said so. You've, you're, you're, you were asking an open-ended question. I take it as a rhetorical question. Matthew 27, 27 to 37. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. They gathered the whole battalion before him. Think about that spectacle. In what arena do you gather a whole battalion before one criminal? They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him. Twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. Kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. The, the irony that, that associates itself to this entire trial, mockery trial, the beatings, crucifixion of Jesus is fascinating because they are carrying out Scripture when they're doing this. 
They spit on him, took the reed and struck him on the head. Of course, beating him on the head with a reed with a crown of thorns there just drives the thorns greater into the head. When they mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. The purpose of this, by the way, was to deaden uh, his senses, to dull the pain. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. You'll remember that the Jews said, no, 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 take that down and make it say, Jesus, who said he was king of the Jews. And Pilate's response, what I have written, stands written. So even in the mockery and the malignity of his crucifixion, he was identified as king of the Jews. Also king of heaven comes up uh, throughout Matthew. 32 times king of heaven is used. Matthew uses more Old Testament quotations and allusions than any other book. 130 Old Testament quotations and allusions with reference to the person and work of Jesus. Often in this gospel, you'll find this, that that which was, that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. He's he's continually ties Jesus' words and action to fulfillment of prophecy. Nine times in Matthew and not once in Mark, Luke, or John. He's the climax of the prophets. He's the son of man. He's the servant of the Lord. He's the son of David. Nine times in Matthew's gospel, references to Jesus as the son of David occur. That's significant. In the other three gospels, only six times in all the others. Nine times in Matthew. You get the sense that Matthew is driving home a point. Here is, behold your king. Here is your Messiah. Israel. Let's read these real quickly. Matthew 12, 39 and 40. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite designation of himself, by the way, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 13, 13 to 15. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see. Hearing they do not hear. Nor do they understand. Indeed in their case the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. With their ears they can barely hear. Their eyes they've closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Matthew 13, 35. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Matthew 7, 5 to 13. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. This is the Mount of Transfiguration encounter. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, have no fear. They lifted up their eyes. They saw no one but Jesus only. Remember Moses and Elijah were there communing with him, the the representation of, of the law and the prophets. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. You see that we talk about this proleptic look at prophecy, how you understand prophecy in the scriptures. There's an, oftentimes an immediate fulfillment in the short term, but an ultimate fulfillment in the long term. So Elijah does come. He'll restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has come. And they did not recognize him, but, to, but did to him whatever they pleased. 
so also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist as, as Elijah. But what's the contribution of Matthew to the body of Scripture, particularly the New Testament? Well, he traces the genealogy back to Abraham. He makes this compelling, really irrefutable case that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is the, he is the promised king, the Messiah of Israel. He shows connections of prophecy and fulfillment, prophecy and fulfillment in the life, uh, teachings, and ministry of Jesus. He, uh, he speaks uh, of Jewish customs and traditions of Mosaic law, this lost sheep of the house of Israel language. He develops the theme of the kingdom because the Jewish reader would wonder why Jesus did not establish the promised kingdom if he was indeed Messiah. In other words, what they'd been taught, he didn't fit their understanding of what, what it would look like when the Messiah came to establish his kingdom. But there's also, I mean, with, with all of Matthew's emphasis on Jesus being the king of the Jews, there's also a good news portion of this to those who are not Jews. One of the parables, Matthew 13, 38, the field is the world and the good seed is sown, uh, the good seed is the sons of the kingdom, the weeds are the sons of the evil one. So the, the field is the world, not just Israel. Of course, on the Great Commission, make disciples, we read this earlier, of all the ethnoi, of all the people groups. In Matthew 8, in his teaching, 11 and 12, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the son, and think how this settled on the Pharisees. <laughs> While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 21, 33 to 43. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. The tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, stoned another. He sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. The prophets were treated this way. Finally, he sent his son, saying, they will respect my son. When the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits of the seasons. Jesus said to him, have you never read in the scriptures? <laughs> now, again, how do you think that falls on the ears of a Pharisee? A Pharisee had to memorize the Old Testament as a part of his training to become a Pharisee. Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. In summary, 60% of Matthew's 1,071 verses contain the spoken word of Jesus. The portraits that Matthew paints are broad sweeping. You don't have fine details very often. They're organized around things like discourses, miracles, parables, questions, thematically arranged to make this compelling case that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Just look at his work. Just listen to his words. And then, of course, the book comes to a tremendous crescendo. And the ultimate rejection, the death, burial, then the resurrection, the victory, and then the commission of the king. So that's an overview, summary of Matthew's gospel. Any questions or comments before we dismiss?